please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Big exclusive interview of the day. There is scope to improve the Aadhaar Act. That's the word coming in from the CEO of the Unique Identification Authority in his first interview after deposing before the Supreme Court. Defending the government's effort to make Aadhaar mandatory, he claims that making Aadhaar mandatory can help curb terror financing and black money. Why should the Aadhaar card be made mandatory for somebody who doesn't want to link it to their bank account, who doesn't want to link it to their mobile uh, number? What is it in it for the consumer? The government has failed to explain very clearly and articulate that very clearly to the country. So let me explain to you that this Aadhaar program was started in 2010. And since then, we have given Aadhaar to more than 1.2 billion people mm -hmm. now. Now, today, the Aadhaar is the perhaps uh, most widely held identity in our country. Uh, if you see, if uh, take any, for example, take any other identity, for example, how many people have passports, mm. maybe about five crores, how many people will have, a, you know, PAN cards, maybe around 30 crores, you know, how many people will have a voter ID card, so they will have, again, certain numbers. Now, the other problem that used to happen is that even though, let's say, somebody had an ID, mm. right, that ID was only a domain specific. Mm. For example, if you have a voter ID card, you will be using it for the voting purposes. Right. But it was also being used as a proxy identity card for something else also because mm. there was no nationally accepted identity card mm. in our country. For example, if supposing somebody from Tamil Nadu, he brings a Tamil Nadu ration card mm. written in Tamil, and if he was to you know, live in Delhi, would he be able to get any services mm. based on his Tamil Nadu identity card mm. or, or for that matter even Tamil Nadu voter identity mm. card. So this was a big problem for the people you know within our own country that it, at one uh, part of the country he was having an identity yeah. and the moment he moved out to some other place he mm. became identity less. Mm. So therefore this whole Aadhaar came. Now with this Aadhaar was to empower people and empower people with an identity which with, uh, uh, through which he can prove his identity anywhere, anytime. Sure. For example, he wanted to open a bank account. Mm. So he goes and gives his Aadhaar number and then he proves his identity and he's able to open a bank account. Mm. So in this manner, uh, first, you know, it was being used for removing the ghost and duplicates yes. and fake. Yes. Right? Now the second part came. Now the second part was that the our whole system uh, if you see, you know, the incidence of black money, mm. terror financing, mm. if you see that problem, during the last 15, uh, 15 years, a number of committees were constituted, even by the Supreme Court, for example, Justice M.B. Sah Committee on a Black Money, yeah. for example. Yeah. Now, they clearly held, you know, in right back in 2009-10, that there is a need for a central identity mm. through which, you know, the, the duplicate PAN cards and bank accounts, you know, that can be weeded out. Will the Aadhaar Act need to be amended in light of the recommendations of the Shri Krishna Committee? You're a member yeah, yeah, of that yeah, committee, exactly, so you, exactly, know, you exactly. know what you're deliberating so as on. I, as I have already said, that the, there is always a scope for improvement because... You know, so the, there will be need for improvement? I, I, mean, I mean, wherever the Justice Sri Krishna Committee feels that you know, there is uh, some more strengthening is required, mm. definitely we'll take that in a very positive manner and mm. we'll do that. Mm. But that does not mean that the entire Aadhaar Act itself, because you know, let us wait for the Justice Sri Krishna committee, committee. And so just because there are certain improvements, for example, some improvements will be suggested maybe in the IT Act, mm. right? But that doesn't mean that today this IT Act is invalid mm. because till that you sure. know, implement. Uh, so this need for improvement doesn't mm. invalidate the present. Mm. And you can catch that entire conversation at 7 p.m. tonight only on CNBC TV 18. On to all the action from the Lal Street markets continued their strong run for the eighth consecutive day as the Nifty and the Sensex close above the 50 and 100 day moving averages. The Nifty opened below the 10,400 mark but recovered in trade to end above the 10,500 mark. The Sensex recovered 406 points from lows with gains of half a percent. Banks too rallied about half a percent while mid caps outperformed with gains of four fifths of a percent. From the Lal Street to Min Street, the rupee today weakened to a six-month low of 65.46 to the dollar. It has been trading in a range of 14 paise in today's session. On Friday, the U.S. Treasury had added India to the monitoring list for currency manipulation. 
a move that is likely to make the RBI scale back Forex intervention if the dollar strengthens significantly. Other factors putting pressure on the rupee include a higher than expected trade deficit, which has pushed traders to go long on the currency. Dollar strength on the back of demand from oil companies is also pushing the dollar higher. India will experience that successive year of normal monsoon. That is the forecast coming in from the India Meteorological Department. Clarifying on the monsoon conditions, the IMD said that they expect a 97% of normal monsoon this year. And they also expect the La Nina to turn neutral before the monsoon season. This makes it the third straight year of normal rains. The department has also said that it is fairly certain that India will not experience a deficit in rainfall. Now coming to the forecast of ENSO based on MMCFS, it is indicating that this the present weak Lalina condition observed over plastic likely to become ENSO neutral just prior to the monsoon season. So this is indicated here. So currently weak Lalina just minus 0.5, it will be closely by JGA, it will reach to neutral condition just prior to that itself. I think one has to this is a somewhat more serious business, mm. particularly because uh, the forecasts are not that good for the Deccan Plateau mm -hmm. and, the, and the drier regions uh, and uh, towards uh, the later part when the, ra the rains are required more. Mm. The average is all right, but you know the average is uh, by itself. This is a continental country. Mm. It, it's not something which one gets very happily excited about it, <laughs> more on the cautious side, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. One is waiting for more details, particularly the regional forecasts which they've given. On to battleground Karnataka, the Congress party has released a list of 218 candidates out of the 224 for the upcoming state assembly elections. While Chief Minister Siddharamaya will contest from his stronghold in Chamundeshwari, his son will make a political debut from his father's sitting seat, Baruna. Most of the defectors from Jantadal's secular sitting MLAs have been given tickets, but some party men do not seem too happy about the first list of candidates. Some disgruntled party workers took to the streets today, chanting anti Siddharamaya slogans and burning effigies. Things turned a little uglier in Mandya, where some workers vandalized the party's district offices. Voices of dissent were also heard from several other districts. The party's state leadership, however, has underplayed the angst, stating the response was expected. Meanwhile, CNBC TV 18 caught up with Chief Minister Siddharamaya, who is on a campaign trail. He says that he is confident of forming the next government. Speaking exclusively to CNBC TV 18's Rukmini Rao at his constituency, Chamundeshwari, Siddharamaya also rules out any post poll alliance with the JDS. Listen in. What is the reason behind you wanting to contest from just one seat? I never said that that I am contesting from two constituencies. Did I ever say? No. But there was a lot of speculation. No, there was a speculation that I may be contesting from two constituencies. But I never said it. Is the fight going to be really tough this time around? Who told you that really tough? <laughs> on yeah. what basis you are telling that it is really tough? So, what is your own take on the kind of surveys uh, that have come out till now? Internally, what do you no, think no, the no. Congress is well, going to win? I again? have also surveys conducted. If village to village survey is conducted. I am going to win with clear majority. Your son, of course, has gotten a ticket on his political debut as a father. You know, what are you expecting and uh, what is your own expectation out of your son? You see, people, the, constitu the voters of that constituency, they want him to contest from that constituency. That's why he's contesting. Sir, any indications of a post-poll alliance if required with JDS? No. No. Congress party will get the clear majority. On that note, it is time for us to take a short break. But coming up next, American retail giant Walmart may soon acquire Indian e-commerce company Flipkart. CNBC TV 18 learns that a final announcement is expected by the end of this month. All those details when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still with us on Reporter Zari. Straight to the big story from the e-commerce space. Walmart is likely to announce the acquisition of Flipkart within a month. Sources have told CNBC TV 18 that the announcement on this deal could well happen between the end of April or mid-May. Walmart is planning to buy out the majority stake in Flipkart from almost all the investors except SoftBank. 
On to news from the insolvency corner then. In what comes is some relief for Jaiswal. Nico, the Supreme Court has put a hold on all insolvency proceedings against the company. In December, the Reserve Bank of India had identified the company to be sent to the NCLT after it failed to meet certain technical considerations. Ashmit Kumar is here with all the details. Ashmit, what is the company's plan to resolve its debt and what did the Supreme Court observe? That's a big relief coming in for Jaiswal Nico. The Apex Court has stayed the IBC proceedings against the company, giving much needed relief to the company, putting a stay as far as those insolvency proceedings are concerned. Now, keep in mind that here are the facts of the case. In December of last year, the RBI had referred Jaiswal Nico, among others, uh, to the NCLT under the IBC. In fact, State Bank of India was uh, pushed into by the RBI for dragging Jaiswal Nico to the, uh, to the NCLT. The question, however, that arose was that Jaiswal Nico was already in advanced stages of conversations, of dialogue, with various lenders in terms of restructuring, so much so that an MRA or a master restructuring agreement had also, in fact, been uh, agreed upon by the various sides, had been drafted and needed only implementation between the two sides. So much so that the lenders as well uh, favoured a restructuring rather than dragging the company to the NCLT. On the back of all of this, uh, Jaiswal Nico, we understand, had moved the Bombay High Court, had suffered disappointment there and subsequently moved the Apex Court as well. Again, citing that concern that the RBI's referral to the NCLT was premature in nature, that there is a structuring process underway and that even the lenders are on board with that. On the back of these concerns, the Apex Court in its today's interim order has put a stay on those IBC proceedings uh, and this of course keep in mind is an interim prayer. Uh, as of right now, the IBC proceedings cannot continue in the NCLT. This will come back at a later date uh, before the Apex Court again when the Supreme Court will take a look at whether or not the RBI was right or wrong in dragging the company into insolvency into the NCLT when the restructuring talks were already underway. Back to you. Right, Ashmit. But for now, some relief coming in there for Jaiswal. Nico, thank you so much for those details. On to the latest in the PNB fraud probe. The Enforcement Directorate has turned up the heat on Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi, two of the prime accused in the case. CNBC TV 18 learns that the ED has started seizing equity held by Nirav and Choksi across companies. Utkarsh Chaturvedi joins us with more. Utkarsh, what are you picking up? Well, this is a part of the process where Enforcement Directorate really wants to secure the amount of the fraud. Now, what we are picking up is that ED has gone ahead and identified companies where both of these individuals, whether it is Mehul Choksi or Nirav Modi, had have their stake. What we are picking up is uh, that 20% stake in one of the largest entertainment company in India, Wiscraft International Private Limited, has been frozen by ED. Uh, what we pick up from our sources is that this 20% stake was held by a company called Luster. India Private Limited, which is based in Surat. Now, what ED really believes is that this company has investments from Mehul Choksi, and that is precisely the reason why the stake has been frozen. Uh, also, remember that ED has gone ahead and did search and seizures worth over 7,600 crore rupees, including properties, including precious gems and jewels, even even paintings and expensive watches of Nira Modi and Mehul Choksi. And this is a process. This is a continuation of that process. So this is the first company which we are picking up. What our sources in ED tell us is that they will look at other companies as well, where Mehul Choksi or Nira Modi have a direct or indirect stake. Uh, thank you, Utkarsh, for taking us through all those details. On that note, it is time for us to take a short break. But coming up, Dassault Aviation Chief Eric Trapier tells the NBC TV18 that India got a rebate in the Rafale fighter jet deal. That exclusive chat after this short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Reporters Diary. Dassault Aviation Chief Eric Trapier tells CNBC TV 18 that India got a rebate in the current Rafale fighter jet deal. Speaking on the allegations of the inflated price of the Rafale fighter jets, he clarifies that the current deal is priced at the same amount as earlier. Take a look. You have said in the past that you know India in no way has suffered any kind of loss because of the G2G deal. Uh, can you then explain the price difference that we have seen in the G2G deal versus what was negotiated in the, uh, in the MMRCA? There is no difference. There is no difference? No. But the scope is different. Okay. He, uh, ca how can you compare Apple to Apple if you don't have the, uh, the you know... So for me, as an, an aircraft manufacturer, including the radar, including everything, the prices are the same. Mm -hmm. the, they, these are the, the, the prices uh, which are totally in line with the French prices. Mm -hmm. And, but it's different. 36 aircraft of the shelf is different from 126 aircraft. Uh, among them, some 18 were supposed to be produced in France, and others, in a step-to-step -step approach, were supposed to be 
partially uh, manufactured in India. So uh, the comparison, uh, uh, and if you give, ask the experts, the comparison lead to the same price. Right, and and before negotiation, because the 36 was after negotiation, so I had to. To, to give some rebates to to government of India. So there were some rebates in the 36D uh, aircraft D. Yes, of course. So you you are saying that whatever per aircraft price is actually yeah, it was negotiated. A, was a good deal for government of India. A fresh war of words has started between U.S. President Donald Trump and former FBI Director James Comey. In an interview with ABC News' George Stephanopoulos, Comey denounced Trump as morally unfit to be the president. This interview was conducted ahead of the release of Comey's book, A Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies and Leadership. He added that it is possible that Russia has blackmail material against Trump. NBC News' Tracy Potts joins us with more on this war of words. Tracy, how is the Republican Party reacting to this? Well, the reaction from the Republican Party is that Comey is a leaker, as the president has said, and that he should have been fired. The reaction from President Trump, you just said in his tweets, reaction from the White House, or pre-action, I should say, uh, from the White House, because they knew that this was coming out, uh, was that the focus should really be on the credibility of James Comey. That is what the president, the White House, and the Republican Party are trying to focus on. Comey has a lot of explosive uh, details and comments and allegations, but are they credible? That's what his critics say the American public should focus on. Now, you talked about some of the things that came out in the interview. One thing that was interesting was that Comey said that it was unlikely but possible that Russia has information to blackmail President Trump. Keep in mind, it was Comey who went up to Trump Tower two weeks before the inauguration to brief the president uh, on these salacious details, the so-called Russian dossier that had been collected. He said that the president, he says in the book, he said in the interview, uh, that the president uh, denied the allegations, said they were ridiculous, but um, it was Comey's job to go and give him information that he pretty much was assured would probably anger the president-elect. He also talks about those closed-door meetings in the Oval Office and also the dinner where he was called to the White House where he says the president demanded his loyalty. He questions in the Oval Office why everyone else was dismissed when he claims he was pressured to drop the investigation into former NSA director uh, Michael Flynn. Back to you. All right, Tracy, thank you so much for taking us through all those details. Moving on, Martin Sorrell, CEO of WPP, the world's largest marketing communications holding company, steps down from his position, this after 33 years at the helm. The move comes after WPP said that it had appointed lawyers to investigate alleged allegations of personal misconduct by Sorrell. While Sorrell denied these allegations, he wrote a letter to his staff on Saturday and said that in the interest of his employees as well as his clients, it was best for him to step aside. CNBC's Karen So filed this report. It began in 1985 when Sorrell bought a stake in a small manufacturing firm, Wire and Plastics Products. He used the company as a public vehicle to buy communications groups, beginning with the hostile takeover of J. Walter Thompson in 1987 and the acquisition of Ogilvy a few years later. Now, moving into media planners and buyers and market research, Sorrell built WPP into the world's largest advertising and PR firm. In the process, he became one of the UK's highest paid executives. In 2012, almost 60% of investors rejected his pay packet. But in the five years since then, Sorrell owned around £210 million alone due to a contentious performance-linked bonus scheme that continued to draw investor criticism. Earlier this month, the 73-year-old was hit with allegations of personal misconduct and misuse of company assets. WPP said an investigation is ongoing, but that, quote, the allegation did not involve amounts that are material. Sorrell has denied the allegations, but resigned on Saturday anyway, saying the current uh, disruption was putting too much unnecessary pressure on the business. So Martin Sorrell, they're quitting WPP. Now, Samsung launched its latest flagship smartphone, the Galaxy S9, at the Mobile World Congress 2018 in Barcelona. And the product is now available in India. So what's under the hood on this edition of Tech Toys? CNBC TV 18's Mega Vishwanath recaps her experience with using the S9 Plus as her daily driver for the past month. When designing the Samsung Galaxy S9 series, 
the Korean electronics manufacturers, engineers grappled with one basic question. How does one improve an almost perfect device? And then they came up with this answer. Overall, the Galaxy S9 Plus stays true to its predecessors in terms of the built look and feel. But what the engineers did do is that they threw in a few enhancements on the hardware and tools. So the camera got a fillip, they did throw in a few gimmicks, but they left the old, complex user interface intact. I used the S9 Plus for a whole month because Samsung agreed with me when I told them that a two-day trial just won't do the phone justice. And let me say at the onset that I feel the Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus is a great phone. But is it a big upgrade from the Galaxy S8 series? In some cases, sure. Take for instance the dual aperture camera that's mounted on this device. If you've ever used a Samsung smartphone, you know that the company is infamous for oversaturating its images. Thankfully, Samsung seems to have given up on that and this device offers more natural looking tones. In low light conditions, the wide aperture and built-in algorithms produce some beautiful non-pixelated shots. So overall, the camera gets a big thumbs up from me. So the camera is not the only feature to get an upgrade. This time, Samsung also dabbled with the AR emoji mode on the camera app, which basically means is that you can take a selfie, play around with a few animations to create an animated avatar of yourself and your cohorts. It's gimmicky, but the novelty wears off after a while. In terms of hardware, the S9 Plus is pretty impressive. It screams premium and its fluid infinity pool kind of design allows for a display that packs a punch. In terms of performance, the phone is quick and responsive and that 3500 mAh battery lasted me an entire day despite some heavy duty use. But the Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus is not without its drawbacks. My biggest grouse is with the software. It's still not as simplistic as pure Android smartphones. Bixby, Samsung's smart assistant, is still alive. And to put it bluntly, it's not all that smart. S9 Plus is very well priced if you compare it to its rival, the iPhone 10, that starts at 89,000 rupees for the base model. But on a standalone basis, this phone faces some tough competition from Google's Pixel 2 XL. Of course, none of this would matter if you are a die-hard Samsung fan and adore Samsung style and appreciate its panache on its smartphones. That's it on this edition of Tech Toys. I will see you next time. There you have it, everything you need to know about the Galaxy S9. But with that, it is a wrap on this edition of Reporter's Diary. Many thanks for watching, but don't forget to tune in to CNBC TV 18 for the exclusive interaction with UIDAI CEO Ajay Bhushan Pandey at 7 p.m. only on CNBC TV 18.